Welcome everyone. I call the February 15th Planning Commission meeting to order. The main purpose of tonight's meeting is a study session on the 2024 Imagine Bothell Comprehensive Plan Periodic Update. Please note that the session on downtown transition affordable housing overlay has been postponed. So we will not be discussing that tonight. Before the meeting, before we move on to agenda items, I'd like to acknowledge our hybrid meeting format. The City of Bothell is providing an option to attend this meeting either in person or remotely via Zoom. For those who participate via Zoom, the chat and question functions are not available to ensure compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act. We have a public comment agenda item at the beginning of the meeting. This time is for comments on issues not on tonight's agenda. Please limit those comments to three minutes. Public comment and hearing testimony will be allowed both in person and via Zoom. Those wishing to comment via Zoom were asked to submit an online form by 3 p.m. today. People wishing to submit written comments were also requested to submit those comments by 3 p.m. Email was encouraged as well and will be acknowledged. Those in attendance may also make comments and have been asked to indicate their desire to comment on sign-in sheets. We do have sheets, right? Yes, okay, over that away. The Imagine Bothell Notice, City website, and tonight's agenda all provided information to the public for providing comments. The video of this meeting will be streamed live as well as recorded and available for later viewing on the City's YouTube channel. A call-in number was provided on the meeting agenda for meet members of the public who wish to call in by phone and listen live to the meeting. For our call-in members, for, for our phone-in callers, during staff presentations, staff will make every effort to specify which materials they are referencing so that everyone can follow along. At this point, we'll take a moment to acknowledge the attendance of the commissioners. Commissioner Jones. Here. Commissioner Westerbeck. Here. Commissioner Kurd. Here. Commissioner Robeson. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Anders. Here. And Commissioner Gustafson. Here. So all commissioners are present tonight. In addition, we have Deputy Community Director Ashley Winchell, uh, Senior Planner Kirsten Mant, and Senior Planner Dave Boyd are in attendance. And more staff. We have Steve Morikawa. And is that it for staff? All right, I would like to introduce Ryad uh, Thierry. He's our new transportation supervisor who will be helping us with our comp plan. Oh, well, welcome. I'm sure Steve is glad to have the help. <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, lastly, before we begin, I'd like to reiterate some meeting guidelines. For all meeting attendees, please speak clearly and pause frequently. State your name each time before speaking. Mute your microphone when not speaking. If you are also streaming the live video feed, please turn the sound off as there is a delay. For commissioners, at specific breaks in the presentation, I'll be calling on members who wish to speak or ask a question. If you want to speak, please indicate this by raising your hand, and I will call you as I see you. This will help avoid the problem of having two people speaking at the same time. Identify yourself before you ask a question, make a motion, second a motion, or participate in debate and please mute your microphone when not speaking. So the first item on the agenda is public comment. The city has accepted visitor comment in writing as well as accepted sign-up sheets for those who wish to speak at tonight's meeting. Written comments submitted to staff no later than 3 p.m. today were forwarded to all commissioners and are part of the record. And I do not believe we received any written comments. No written comments. All right, thank you. This time is for items not on tonight's agenda. So Director Winchell, Deputy Director Winchell, please let us know if there are any comments received. We have one person on the sign-in sheet, Angela Boyce. Um, if you would like to speak tonight, you can uh, come to the... Correct. You'll need to uh, yeah. push the middle button on the... Uh, and a red light will come on. Hi, my name's Angelia Boyce. I'm not sure if I'm at the right meeting for this comment, but it was on the proposed 
building of five story structures next to homes. And I don't know if this is the meeting after one of the agenda items was moved. Well, we, we did, that item was, was on the agenda, but it's been postponed. Mm -hmm. So you can certainly speak now and then you don't have to sit through the rest of what we, we go through in the meeting. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you have three minutes to speak to that. Okay, uh, right now I live on Northeast 186th Street, right next to a large building that they're putting up. At that time, I didn't know there was a meeting for zoning <clears throat> an apartment structure up next to Northeast 186th Street where we live. I do want to say that it has had detrimental effects to us since this building's gone up and during the build time. The past three years has been um, pretty complicated working with the builders. Um, I've talked um, with, with actual people here at the city about what was zoned and what was permitted during that time. But we've had a lot of problems with street traffic. Um, it's blocking the sun that's coming into our yard. Um, I used to use our backyard as a refuge. It used to be a wildlife um, sanctuary for birds and other animals. Um, all the birds are disappearing. But anyway, I just want to put out there that real thought should be put into allowing this type of structure to go next to residential buildings. It has a great impact on people's lives. It's been on um, our street, you know, traffic. Finally, they had to put up 20 mile an hour things turning out on 104th. It's been very difficult for us. So. I just want to put, um, for people who've lived there for many years, we've lived there for over 30 years, paid taxes, and I know that it's a, it's great for bringing in taxes to Bothell, but um, it's been very detrimental to us in our life. So I just want to put that forward. All right, thank you for your comment. Yes, thanks. Any other members of the audience wish to comment? All right, seeing none. Um, Oh. Uh, there is one person as an attendee, Katie Enquist. Um, I can. Katie, can you hear me? Did you want to speak? You'll have to unmute. Still muted. I'm going to go ahead and promote you to a panelists, see if that. Okay, I, I'm, I assume that uh, she's just uh, wanting to listen in. Uh, Katie, you can send me a message if you do want to speak. All right, then uh, seeing no other public commenters, we will move on to the next item, which is approval of the minutes. We have before us the minutes of the January 18th meeting. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? Commissioner Robson. Motion to approve the minutes. All right, there's a motion to approve the minutes of the January 18th meeting. Is there a second? I yes. second. It has been seconded, moved and seconded. Is there any discussion around those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor of approval? Aye. Aye. All right. All right. We have unanimous approval of those minutes. Moving on to new business. Is there any new business for us this evening? It's Looking. not new business, but uh, I was able to uh, get Katie Anquist uh, uh, on as a panelist. Katie, if you could raise your hand if you want to speak, otherwise I'll put you back as an attendee. All right. Seeing no action. I guess we'll move on. So uh, looking to staff, any new business? No, seeing none, we will then move to our next agenda items. 
uh, first indicated is the study session on downtown traditional affording housing overlay. And I believe Senior Planner Boyd will talk to us about uh, this item being postponed. Uh, thank you. Um, really, I don't have much to add uh, beyond what's in the in the memo. Uh, we are going to uh, wait. Uh, we've tentatively scheduled uh, this to come back to you on March 15th, uh, but we want to hear from Council uh, in their discussion on the 2023 docket, and uh, and there are some options uh, open to them. So uh, it will be in the imagine the March imagine Bothell notice. Uh, as a tentative meeting on March 15th, and uh, we'll be getting back to you uh, with more information um, after that. Uh, Commissioner Robson. Thank you, Chair. Can I request that um, we have someone from ARCH here for that meeting? I have some questions regarding how affordable housing affects the overall housing market, and I just, I feel like, um, that input would be really valuable when we do have that meeting. Yes, I think that was requested at the last study session. And, and so thank you for reminding me. I'll, I'll uh, make sure that uh, Mike Stanger is, uh, well, if he's able to, to be there, uh, and if not, uh, at least to provide some information. All right. Uh... Any other comments on this proposed postponed item? Seeing none, I know there's a lot of interest in this item, so mark your calendars. It will be on our March 15th agenda for further discussion. Thank you, Senior Planner Boyd, and we'll see you then. Okay, tentatively March 15th. <laughs> Yes, tentatively March 15th. Watch the uh, announcements, watch the posted agendas, and you can see whether it's on or not. And you can sign up to get notice when those agendas are posted. So our next item is a study session on the introduction to the 2024 Imagine Bothell Comprehensive Plan Update. And I believe we have Senior Planner Kirsten Mant leading us on this one. Yes, and uh, Steve's going to be speaking as well to the transportation component of that as well. Okay. And it looks like host disabled participant screen sharing. So I need to get that undisabled so I can present. So we need to uh, share screen here? Yes, I will fix those settings. If I can, if I can fix those settings. The joys of hybrid meetings. <laughs> okay, Kirsten, I made you a host. Okay. So you will be the only other person that can share. If that doesn't work, you can send me your PowerPoint and I will. Looks like it's coming up. Here we go. Sounds good. All right. So tonight I was wanting to bring just kind of a higher level overview of what is the comp plan, why do we do it, why do we have to do it, uh, where we're at in the process and where we have to go still. So baseline, what is the comp plan? Um, I pulled this quote from MRSC. If you haven't been familiar with that website, it's a really great resource for planning information in Washington. But pretty much what it does is it sets out a, a series of goals and objectives with associated policies and actions that will implement what happens in the city. What do we want to see happen on the ground in development? And it is a, the goal is also to help guide the decisions of staff and officials um, and commissioners. So in the infographic I put together here is just to kind of show from the comp plan to what we see on the ground, what goes in between those things. So three of the main things that the comp plan influences is it has to be consistent with our Botham Municipal Code. So that's all the things in the BMC, including zoning, our capital budget, uh, the design and construction standards that come out of public works, and all those come together to create a, both private development on the ground and public development, so a lot of our capital projects. Uh, the basis for all this is the Growth Management Act passed in 1990. The big thing that that did was establish the urban growth boundary. Simple terms is growth goes into it, 
growth stays outside of it. So within the urban growth boundaries where we really want to drive more of our dense urban development outside of the urban growth boundary, things like agricultural uses, rural uses, uh, resource lands, forest lands, things like that. Uh, not all states are required to do comp planning. We uh, are within, uh, not states, uh, within counties that are required to plan under the RCW. Some choose to anyway, some don't. Uh, within the GMA goals, there are 14 of those. I've listed out the 14 themes of those goals. They have longer descriptions that kind of go into what about these themes we're supposed to be following. And then when it comes down to who we plan under, so Puget Sound Regional Council is the regional planning body that we plan under. It's for four counties. It's Tahomish, King, Pierce, and Kitsap County. They also develop the regional plan for growth, which is Vision 2050. And they draft and adopt what are called multi-county planning policies, which I'll get into in a little bit later. Uh, this slide is really just to give you an idea of how everything kind of fits together, all the different agencies that work within the state and how that filters down to what we have to do. So the basis is the GMA that I mentioned a bit earlier. And the Office of Financial Management is really who was tasked with creating projections. These are both population projections as well as employment projections. And then they assign a certain target to PSRC as our regional body. And then PSRC assigns targets to all the counties within PSRC. Uh, we have the lucky distinction of planning under two counties, so we get two of everything, which is fun, a fun challenge. Uh, and within the county, there is a, a segments of different types of jurisdictions based on size and a number of other factors. The biggest ones being the metros, so that's like Seattle, Bellevue, some of the larger cities. We are in the next bracket down, which is core cities. We have that distinction because we have a regional growth center and are of a certain size. And so within the core cities group, we speak amongst ourselves to figure out what's a fair target based on size, capacity, resources, uh, things like transit come up in those discussions. So there's a number of cities with us in King County and in Snohomish County, it's us in Linwood. And then the Department of Commerce has an interesting role. They kind of come along for the ride throughout the process and help develop guidance for different things and uh, help answer questions and provide data and different analysis. So they're sort of a helpful partner throughout this whole process. One of the first things that we've done as a part of this whole process is the Buildable Lands Report work. We started that in 2019 and 2021. Again, we get to do two, which is fun. Um, within that work, we work with the counties to look at what have we built since the last Buildable Lands Report? How did we do? How are we on track for, or not on track for, the targets established by the last comp plan? And what do we have left based on our current zoning capacity? We analyzed capacity for three different types of land, vacant, partially used, and redevelopable. There's different definitions and thresholds for those, slightly different between the counties, but about the same. And a lot of the time has to do with what's on the parcel, what's the value of the improvements on a parcel, and what feasibly could get developed based on those things. We also account for the fact that we know a certain amount of land just isn't gonna develop, just because that just happens. Uh, and so those are certain what we call market factors that help try and create a realistic picture of what we have left with our existing zoning. The other big thing it does is establish targets for both population and housing. Snohomish County does population, King County does housing, so we kind of convert in between the two and as well as for employment. And these targets are for the planning window ending in 2044. That will go into how we go about determining our land use assumptions and things like that in our comp plan. Growth targets, I won't get into the nitty gritty on the numbers too much, um, but you can see we have, uh, for King County was a 5,800 housing unit growth target, and this is the net growth. We had a conversion in order to show that in population so we could kind of speak between Snohomish and King County. We do have a deficit in just sort of the baseline growth target numbers. And these are what were established prior to the passing of HB 1220, which I'll get into in a little bit um, later. The only place we didn't have sort of a baseline net uh, deficit was in housing units in King County. But like I mentioned with HB 1220, that doesn't really tell the full story. 
So HB 1220, uh, it requires a lot of things, but in just the discussion for growth targets, it now requires that that growth target be allocated amongst different levels of what are, we're calling affordability need. It doesn't change our baseline target, it just changes how that has to get allocated. Uh, a couple of the acronyms I wanted to point out here uh, are PSH, which is Permanent Supportive Housing. Essentially, it provides housing to folks permanently that may or may not be able to pay a very, very small amount or maybe anything at all. It also has a number of supportive services that go along with that that are supposed to help tenants with housing stability. Uh, AMI is a sort of a more generic term for area median income that gets used a bunch of different ways. Uh, HUD calls it MFI, median family income, and then the breakdowns of the what, how you calculate out the segments kind of varies depending on the group, and that's something I know uh, Mike Stanger from ARCH has a lot more knowledge on in terms of which county agencies calculate it one way, HUD calculates it another way. Um, so that can be something that he speaks to probably a little later on. In terms of how this is gonna break down for us, it's still a little bit up in the air. The counties are still trying to figure out how they wanna assign these allocations. Uh, King County does have a recommendation from their affordable housing committee to the GMPC or the Growth Management Board for King County. And then Snohomish County is still trying to wait on some of our more finalized OFM numbers. So OFM is the one determining what the affordability need is for each of these segments. And so we've been had a couple of postponed meetings with them uh, to discuss further how we wanna allocate these since they don't know for sure what the numbers are. So still kind of up in the air, a lot of questions. It gets very complex and we're hoping to have a much more in-depth discussion about this when we know more. And then I wanted to just talk a little bit about the update framework in terms of what we're required to do and why. So like I mentioned earlier, there's the multi-county planning policies, and then the counties develop their own planning policies that have to be consistent with the multi-county planning policies. Our comp plan has to show consistency with all of those, as well as our regulations. And all of that is what filters down into the projects that we get. I think you've seen this slide before when Ashley was talking a bit about the docket, but just kind of reiterating the areas of focus we see is really key for the update. These aren't all of the elements and sub areas that are going into it, but just some of the really key components. The first being we have to meet our GMA requirements. That's kind of the baseline of we gotta do it, we're gonna do it. Same kind of thing with the growth allocations. We know it's something we have to accommodate for in one way or another, so that's a major component in our land use assumptions and our housing policy. We wanna make sure we're undertaking a really robust and inclusive engagement and visioning process. That's gonna be a bulk of the year in the spring and the summertime along with working on developing land use assumptions is kind of the visioning process, getting out into the community, talking to folks about this stuff, and making sure we're doing it as equitably as we can. Uh, one thing that Steve's gonna mention a little bit more is where we're looking at adopting a new transportation level of service. This would be a multimodal level of service rather than what we currently have. And then a couple areas of emphasis that have been a big part of the new Vision 2050 plan as well as the MPPs and CPPs is an increased emphasis on diversity, equity, inclusion, and racial equity and uh, climate change. So those are gonna be two big pushes as well for what the work we're doing. We also, we wanna make it prettier. <laughs> for lack of a better term, we wanna make it really, you know, more, more of a functional, usable document. Right now it's a little dry, um, if I'm being generous. Um, and we want to make sure it's something that the community feels like they can pick up and look at and it means something. So that's something that we we're really looking forward to kind of working through. And then finally, right now, the way the plan reads, we have action items in each element. Uh, we would really like to create rather an implementation plan or an implementation element that looks at more of kind of like a three to five year basis. So we're really able to reevaluate at a more a higher frequency, where we're at, what are we doing, how are we gonna make it happen. It also will align with some new reporting requirements. We have to do some additional reporting every five years moving forward. So it'll kind of help set staff up for success that we're not kind of scrambling at the four and a half year mark of like, ah, we have to do this report. And then a little high level overview on engagement. This is still something we're developing with our consultant team but we have an idea of kind of the main types of work we wanna do. We wanna do kind of two major traditional open house in-person events, 
One, ideally, at sort of the end of the summer, early fall, when we've wrapped up a lot of our engagement work over the summer and are really getting into draft plan development. And then one kind of at the beginning of 2024, where we have some draft elements and draft language to get in front of people and get some feedback. We do want to do some more targeted engagement through focus groups. The two main topics of those will probably be climate change and racial equity. And so we're working on reaching out to the community right now and figuring out CBOs, different residents. We want to make sure we're targeting you know, our renter community. We have a number of manufactured home communities, a couple of which we know have some pretty robust um, HOAs. So we're working in on who can we get to talk to us. We want to try and get as wide of a group of people, but also understanding that um, we've got to meet folks where they are and figure out how they, how they, how they talk to us. Uh, we're also hoping to do just public events where and when we can. We know throughout the summer we have a lot of great activities that we can leverage. Summer nights is one that we know will be one where we can come down, set up a booth, maybe have some activities, talk to people. Um, so anywhere we can get you know staff out or maybe some of our consultants out at some of these events we already have. That's something we're looking at doing as much as we can. And then we do have a new online engagement platform. So that's going to be a way for us to be really flexible with our engagement and continue that process throughout the next year and a half. And um, we can always adjust things as we're going, come up with new ideas, and really um, add that nice component to everything else. And I will say, too, from the current team, moving to hybrid meetings has allowed for more folks to come to public hearings. Um, and that's been really great to have that you know, ad added engagement. So we're hoping to see the same thing with this as well. And then in terms of updates, right now we're hoping to do monthly check-ins with you folks. It'll probably get more topical as we start to do more of the actual drafting of the elements. Um, but for the first probably six months or so, a lot more just kind of these kinds of discussions, <coughs> asking questions, getting feedback, um, giving you updates on what we've done and how that went. And then for council, we're at this point proposing probably quarterly in-person check-in meetings and maybe with some more sort of staff report type, up, staff report type updates at a more frequent rate than that, just to make sure that they know what's going on and we can get feedback. And then the last slide for me is just a quick discussion about the scope of work we have with our prime consultant, Burke. We have a couple of subs from them. This is just the list of the 10 overall task items that we have in our scope with them. And then with that, I'm going to turn over to Steve and then we'll take some questions. So good evening. Um, the transportation element update is going to be large and really exciting. Um, because it is so large, we actually have engaged a separate consultant, and we are coordinating. Um, community development is going to do the overall comprehensive plan, and um, Public Works with Fur and Peers is going to do the transportation element. Um, if you want more um, information about that. I think we're scheduled to go to the February 28 council meeting with um, contracts, large amendments to each contract to get us through at least the next year of work for that. Um, so one of the first things, this is a list of key elements, kind of like the overall plan, but more focused on transportation. Probably the most important thing that we're talking about is multimodal level of service. And what that means is we want to make sure that um, we're not just looking at a vehicle-based system. Our current adopted plan essentially measures our transportation system by how many vehicle trips and how many vehicle trip capacity that we have. What we want to do is take that and look at vehicles, but we also want to look at transit. We want to look at bicycles. We want to look at pedestrians, um, even micro-mobility like scooters and things. Um, the reason you want to do that is you want to focus on the whole system, not just vehicles. You want an integrated system. And right now, when we have transportation impact fees, they can be used for vehicle-based projects, not necessarily multimodal projects. So we want to get that multimodal look at everything. So we have started looking at that. And like Kirsten said, we're going to be coming back and checking in with you. So one of those monthly meetings, we'll come back and talk to you about multimodal level of service, or MMLOS is a abbreviation you're going to learn. Um, we're going to be wrapping our public stakeholder engagement under the umbrella of the whole thing, so it'll hopefully look seamless. But we will have our staff, as well as consultant, um, talking to you about transportation things and talking and engaging the public about that as well. 
We will be doing an existing conditions analysis pretty much up front in spring. Essentially, that says what does it look like on the ground today. Um, it also helps calibrate our projection models. Um, you got to look at something to make sure you're modeling it and it comes out with the right result. So we do that first, and then we start developing our um, modeling efforts for land use. Once we get any land use changes that are proposed, it goes through our modeling and we test them to see, make sure our multimodal system can take and uh, support the land use as planned. When we look at everything, we'll be looking through lenses of climate change. We'll be doing resiliency. I'll talk about it a little bit later. Everything is safety. Um, so we look at previous accidents. We also look at what we build. You can build things in certain ways that typically have resulted in safer or better facilities. And you look at interaction between the different modes as well. We will review and update transportation policies of the existing plan as necessary. And one of the biggest things that have come out of this is a project list. It's a 20-year list. And that's probably one of the most challenging things because we're going to take all the modes. We're going to have safety projects. We're going to have bike projects, which we already identified. We're going to have ped projects. We're going to have um, vehicular projects. We might even have some transit support type projects. Somehow we have to prioritize that because we don't we have limited funds. So there there is going to be a financial plan. How much money can we get? Grants, outside sources, um, our own sources to support what we can build in 20 years. So that's the funding assessment part. We will participate in the SEPA. We will do our section under the entire um, SEPA process. The last two are in a different color because they're technically not um, a comp plan. They're standards, but any changes we make in the network and that requires a different standard, we will update the standards. Um, and then the concurrency list and fees, again, that's very important. So that's what, when developers come in and they're gonna create or contribute to growth, they need to pay and help us um, build our transportation to support that. And that's what the, the fee is all about. Next one. Thanks. So that's a lot. Um, so I kind of grouped them in a little bit in how I kind of look at it, just to keep it in my head. So one of the first things is uh, focus on the multimodal transportation network. Each of these are different modes. You know, we have a street network. Um, transit has a network on the routes they use. We have recently um, worked through a bike plan, so that's going to wrap into our comprehensive plan. We will likely come back spring and early summer to talk to you about sidewalk prioritization and filling in gaps. And we want to actually try to address freight, which is one of the things we've been trying to do for years, but make sure we um, can get our trucks through that support um, local economy. So priorities. So again, what's most important to the city, and these are some of the things we heard, um, Mobility, climate change, environment, resiliency, safety, economics, sustainability, maintenance, and equity. It's a lot. Some of them we will address um, in separate sections, like safety. We will actually do analyses and things. And some of them will be a combination of looking through a specific lens. So if we're looking at a project, how does that affect um, the environment? Does it put a more a bigger footprint on the ground, which is, you know, or a smaller footprint? Um, so it's not just the analysis itself, but how we generate this list of projects. You guys are probably wondering what that picture is, but it's actually our seismic retrofit of Sammamish River Bridge, which is part of resiliency. So one of the things we're going to do is figure out, in case of an event like an earthquake, where are our primary um, routes and make sure we understand where the vulnerable parts are, and those will generate probably some projects as well. So the process is start with the modes and understand what networks you have that you're going to integrate into this multimodal system. And then use your priorities to support and build and create that network. And we will create policies and update policies as necessary to make sure that it's all in line. I think that's the last one. Oh. So the transportation update in terms of timeline there's a lot on there, but essentially we have started scoping already. Um, community development, Kirsten and them started last year to try to get a handle on 
how big this thing was going to be, and we continue to do that as we get feedback input through the public process. We have started to look at MMLOS um, methodology, multimodal level of service. Like I said, we're going to do existing conditions, probably the first thing up, and we're going to start climate change work in support of a grant, I believe, that um, Kirsten's group got, um, that we have certain deadlines. We will likely start, I didn't put this up here, the safety um, analysis as well, because we can start collecting the data that we need to work through that uh, process. Uh, we will participate through all the engagement, and there are certain touch points that, and certain items that um, the transportation consultant and we would like to get input engagement with the public, so we will participate that starting in spring. An important part for us is when community development hands us a couple of scenarios for land use that we can actually test, and that's when we start seeing what we can do with our transportation system and how much we can support and what we need to do. That will go on through summer and in fall, and in the fall becomes the part where we aggregate those projects we identified in each of those different categories and we start listing what we can do in our 20-year period. So toward the end of the year, the comp plan would be kind of complete in its draft form and SEPA will have started in fall and kind of move into 2024. And I believe we're gonna be coming back to the planning commission to start talking and finalizing and adopting things in early 2024 through spring and council to follow that. So in Late 23 and 24 is about when we can start working on our standard um, details that developers use and we use to build our network. Um, but that has to follow all the, the process. And then the last thing the transportation would do is talk about concurrency or basically how developers measure what their impact is on our level of service and system and what fees they pay. So that won't take place until early 24 and probably take about half a year or so to get through. And I think with that, we are done with the presentation portion. I'm sure you all have questions. All right, commissioners, questions for staff? Uh, Commissioner Westerbeck, then Commissioner Jones, or did you? Oh, no. No, okay. You... <laughs> So your hand moved. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you to the staff. Uh, excellent presentation. Answered most of my questions as well. Um, just want to uh, also just call out, um, just it's, it's wonderful to hear about the multimodal level of service being addressed now. Uh, I think that's something that probably you've wanted to do for a long time and it's long overdue, so <laughs> that's great. Um, also excited about the climate change goals and the racial equity analysis being included. So thank you for including those components. I had uh, two questions. One was uh, in, in terms of the city's growth targets, and I understand they're not set as yet, you're still working through those um, using the process that you described, but do you anticipate any challenges for the city of Bothell? It's a bit of a tough question to ask since there's a little bit up in the air. And I think that the, the challenges we foresee are we're not going to be alone. I think every jurisdiction is going to have to answer some big questions about how do we accomplish this. Uh, one thing I will say is that the Department of Commerce did issue their draft guidance on how we are to show compliance with these affordability need ranges. So it's not necessarily going to be, I mean, they, they understand that there was no funding associated with this bill. So without real money, it's gonna be really hard to physically create those units. So what the guidance has proposed at this point is that what we'll do as part of our land capacity analysis for the Department of Commerce as a part of this work is we have to look at, of the zoning capacity we have, what types of units can come out of that, whether that be apartments, low rise, uh, walk-ups, things like that. And they've said these different types of apartments could potentially, or other types of units, could potentially handle X range of affordability with subsidies, grant money, other things. So what they're letting us do is do an analysis of our existing zones, what kind of housing could be built in those zones, and then based on that, what levels of affordability are feasible within those types of housing units. So that's some of the analysis work we need to do to figure out what do we already have, what would we need to change in order to make those accommodations. Um, I know that um, just thinking back to doing the King County buildable lands work, the biggest amount of 
redevelopable land we had in King County or have is in the R900 or in our R9600 zone, which is a single family zone. So that would all basically count only as I believe 120 plus AMI. So we know we're going to have to do, we're going to have to do some things, um, but we think that it's feasible um, and it's work that we can do. And we have a lot of assistance, both from Department of Commerce, the counties, ARCH is a really big help, and they're already doing some of the capacity analysis work for us, too. So, and we can certainly come back and do a much more in-depth discussion on that, probably when we know more about what we're going to have to do. But if you want to earlier, we can talk to Mike Stanger and maybe do a presentation on just some of the basics of um, what the options are for allocations. I could probably give a semi-simplified description of how it works, but I don't, it's taken me a super long time to kind of figure out. So if you want to, I can get into that, but um, otherwise you can come back later and get more detailed. I really appreciate the answer. And I, I think that you'll probably hear, I've heard in several of the meetings, just a request to learn more mm -hmm. about how we're going to meet the affordability targets and how that impacts some of, of what we're recommending. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think it'll be great to have more information about that at an, another session. Yeah. And I, I think the key message there is it, our baseline number doesn't change. The targets established by the Buildable Lands Report are what they are. It's just how they're allocated. And the methodologies proposed right now range between everyone has to be assigned the same number based on the ranges required for the county. There's other ones that talk about more of what they're calling a fair share methodology, whereby by the end of the 2044 planning period, all jurisdictions will have been able to plan for enough housing stock so that accounts for existing affordable units. And then there's a third methodology that both counties are working on, which is what King County is kind of leaning towards, which would be a version of method A. So it's basically saying, we're gonna take care of affordable housing with new, new growth. And it's assigned equally, every jurisdiction gets the same apportionment, but then we're gonna look at some local factors to adjust for that, um, because it makes more sense to kind of target it a little bit more. And Snohomish County is considering something sort of similar to King County, a little bit different, um, but they are a little further away from making a recommendation um, than King County is right now. Right. May I ask my second question? Certainly. Um, I hope my, I think my second question is less complex. <laughs> uh, so um, have, 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 have you started to consider the impact of wildfires as a result of climate change and is that going to be part of some of the climate change component of the plan and when i say wildfires i mean not only the damage from wildfires mm -hmm. but also things like increased wildfire smoke because we're expecting to see that mm -hmm. um, increase quite a bit over the next 50 years yeah we've been working with um, k4c which is a climate planning group within king county on some draft policy language um, and right now there is a number of different policies related to wildfire, both you know, actual wildfire damage, like you mentioned, for some of those communities that are closer to where the damage actually happens, as well as issues from smoke and some resiliency measures and mitigation. Um, what kinds of community needs might we have for people that need to shelter somewhere, things like that. So there's a number of different draft policies that some are super applicable to us, some less so. Uh, what they're trying to do right now is determine sort of the top tier policies that they'll provide a lot of guidance on to jurisdictions, but also listing some of the other, other stuff that's um, maybe less applicable to a wider range of jurisdictions, but are still important. And then what we need to do as a, a staff and with you all and with our consultant team is determine of those draft policies, of all the different things you could include in a climate element, what, are, what do we care about the most, um, especially with some of the direction um, that we want to go maybe in future with some more actionable things. So, yeah, there's definitely considerations for that in those draft policies. I'd like to clarify something I think I heard you say. Mm -hmm. um, is a single family home in Bothell uh, only affordable to lowest making 120% of the AMI? In, I'm, I was just trying to remember in the guidance from Department of Commerce how they're categorizing that type of zoning. Okay. And I believe it was either at over 120 AMI or over 100 AMI. Okay. But I can get back to you with a more specific number. Yeah, that, that'd be interesting. Yeah. And from what I recall, at least the HUD AMI for Seattle Bellevue area is quite high this year. I believe it's over $134,000. So. Hmm. Okay. 
Are there commissioner questions, comments? Yes, Commissioner Anders. Thank you. I have a transportation question from the list. Um, I don't quite understand the difference between the scoping uh, component of that and the development of projects. What's going to happen at that two, at those two phases that are different? So I think the scope thing is more of what areas we're going to touch. Like you know, is climate change important? Is um, resiliency important? And large topics like that. The project list is very specific. It will be something like um, improve, build a multi, like I believe this project will probably land on the list. So let's say 9th Avenue between 228th and 240th, that would be a multimodal project. So we would improve the roadway, it's near a school, we'd look at safety, we'd look at the bike lanes, which would be protected there, and we'd look at the sidewalk. So that's a very specific project list. The scoping started earlier, I think in 2022, at a very high level to say what is the comp plan going to cover and what it's going to look like. And my suspicion is we go through the public process, there will be little pieces there that maybe none of us thought about. And that's a good thing to add in one particular section, like something about climate change we didn't think about or something about safety we didn't think about. So then we would probably want to think about that in our analysis, in our review. Um, it could result in a specific project. It may not. Other commissioners? Commissioner Westerbeck. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> just some little things. Um, so just so I understand, because I was around for the last comp plan, but I don't always track it. Um, council votes on the final plan in, <clears throat> was it summer 2024? And then, um, and then do we uh, send it up to PSRC or... Uh, something like that for approval at the end of the year? Yeah, so it's due in December 24, ultimately. Okay, so it is end of the year. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. Unless they give us another extension because it needs to be 1220. But Did we need them in the past? I don't remember. It's, this one has already been extended. Oh, okay. Um, but as we've, we haven't heard anything else about any potential future extensions. But. And then um, love seeing the climate change and equity added in emphasis. Um, it's kind of shocking we didn't weren't thinking about that as much in 2014 15 but there it is um that's going to be really important um and obviously we've got a, probably a pretty strong housing emphasis in this as well it looks like those seem like the 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 three uh, really 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 pressing problems that's commentary not a question um i know in the last plan <clears throat> each sub area um i guess you might, we must have had community meetings and things like that um, uh, we're going to be doing that again. I mean, I know there's lots of outreach, uh, and revisiting those neighborhoods and talking about, you know, like you said, like with the buildable and lands report, what's appropriate now, um, for those, for those areas. Is that part of the process? Like meeting with people, seeing what they want, but also understanding like, okay, well, you know, maybe we do need to accept more growth in some of these areas, not only for the buildable lands report, but just because, you know, time's moved on. Is that Part of the discussion with the different neighborhoods and sub areas we haven't spoken too much on um, a sub area specific basis except for some of the sub areas we know we really need to do some planning a big planning effort with one of those being country village yeah um, that's one of the areas that has seen enough change that the existing code and the sub area doesn't do a lot for what's really happening there right now so that's one area right. where we do want to do a pretty significant sub area push it's also a candidate countywide growth center, which is a new designation, um, I think, as of this year. And we have two of those. Downtown is also a candidate, although we know we're pretty much on track probably to meet those thresholds. Sure. Um, so that's probably going to be where the biggest sub area specific outreach effort is. But we are also open to ideas about who in the community would be good to talk to. If there's contacts you think would be important at the community level, the neighborhood level, we would definitely be open to getting those um, those contacts what i'm kind of thinking about is you know i've i've read through the comp plan a few times I skimmed it as well but um <clears throat> there's a lot of language in there that may be a little um you know getting a little uh, old at this point saying oh this this neighborhood's all about you know large lots and single homes and things like that and we're, and we're already looking considering missing middle and um and how to uh you know make the best use of our billable lands and things like that so I was just hoping we'd crack open some of those areas of the plan and reevaluate some of those areas and say maybe we remove some of that language 
and um, make it a little more open, um, a little more, um, uh, you know, uh, inclusive and a little less exclusive just for the next 10 years, you know, mm -hmm. last 10 years, a lot happened. So um, I know looking through it, some of that seems a little um, antiquated at times. So, yeah. And that's not to say we're not um, going to be reviewing all the sub area plans. It's just in terms of like the big planning effort. I think yeah. language is a really important piece of yeah. review, particularly the equity component. Yep. And that is a big emphasis from the CPPs as well as making sure, are we using you know, coded language in some of the areas. Well, that's there. partly what I'm getting at. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that, are, that emphasis some, on yeah, there's been exclusionary sort of planning we did 100 years ago that's still very much part of our codes. Yeah, and that is some of the guidance from the counties as well. Cool. From some of the um, sessions I've said in on, on the CPPs. So we will be reviewing uh, sub-area plans for some of the language. Um, but again, in terms of the nitty-gritty of, like, big planning, big sub-area planning efforts like we did in Canyon Park, <clears throat> probably doing more of that for kind of mm -hmm. the village. Yeah. No, it's very encouraging. I was hoping it was, you know, kind of scrubbing and reviewing of language and kind of reevaluating whether we captured the the next 10 years, the essence of the next 10 years and how we wanted to present those areas. So that's great. And some of that will probably come out of the land use evaluations as well. Sure. Um, and what happens with some of the current ordinances going through the pike and where we're going to have to potentially provide some more capacity. And if that ends up being in certain areas, do we have to make some changes for the sub area plan? So a lot of that's really just really up in the air because we haven't started to do that analysis yet. Okay, glad to hear it's on the table. Thanks. Other commissioners? Commissioner Curd. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, it's always interesting to hear um, how um, the comp plan process is explained. It's so massive and <laughs> overwhelming at times. So um, thanks for bringing clarity. Uh, my question is about outreach. And I know that it's still up in the air and things are still kind of far out. Um, but I'm wondering about um, our role on the commission um, is to um, provide our own uh, kind of expertise and um, guidance. But we also are all kind of um, planner pilled a little bit and we all have discussions and conversations with people in the community about planning whether we want to or not someone comes up to me at a uh, meeting and they say they're from Bothell and they talk about sidewalk gaps okay well there's a comp plan feedback right there so I'm wondering how um, you or the consultant would like us to um, collaborate and partner um, whether that's providing a QR code to the comp plan um, uh, website um, to kind of push them towards the more formal way to, to do that, or if you'd like to um, um, have us frame conversations a certain way just um, so that we can be um, really part of the process as well, I think that would be really helpful um, and we could be advocates for more engagement. So um, that's more of a comment, but um, maybe an opportunity to look for in the future, and I hope that's helpful. That's really helpful, and that's something we can um, talk about internally and talk with our consultant team to see how have you potentially engaged planning commissions or similar bodies in the past, and what have you found useful, and how do you think we should create some of that advocacy that you're talking about? So that's thank you for that comment. That's really helpful. Great. Thanks. Um, and then my other question is about the public works element, um, and um, I appreciate that there's more capacity in the <laughs> Uh, the department right now, um, but I'm also looking at the schedule and seeing that there are some pretty tight deadlines, um, and that's <laughs> that's overwhelming to me. I can't imagine what it, um, what it looks like um, when you're looking at calendars, um, and so I'm wondering, like, if there's different levels of um, prioritization on these um, uh, uh, different timelines and different um, kind of check-ins in the comp plan process and um, if there are any um, big consequences for delay or uh, missing some of those deadlines, how you plan to um, um, staff and, and build capacity to, to get those um, in. I'm just wondering, I know that some processes take a long time just because of coordination with um, consultants and, and so on, but I'm wondering what you're doing as part of public works to um, kind of set the stage for uh, moving the comp plan stuff forward. 
So from a transportation element side? Yeah. Okay, just making sure you said public work. So um, that's a big part of the gentleman sitting behind me. Um, no pressure, yeah. Um, it is very quick. I mean, we counted the months. It was something like 11 months we got to do this entire comp plan, in, which is extremely quick. But we did sit down with both consultants and work out a timeline. Um, so part of their contract is assuring us that that timeline is sufficient now. That doesn't mean anything. We've done certain things. We're teaming up with them. Um, not The consultant in our case is not doing everything. Uh, we're doing things like resiliency in the house. Um, resiliency often means knowing where the weak points of your system are. It also no means working with our emergency group that has already developed some routes and everything. So a lot of it would be coming from us anywhere. And that, to me, is not very productive with a consultant. So we will team and do certain things. The other thing we are doing is, as an example on the sidewalk, um, Rita, who is our sidewalk program engineer, talked to the council once and essentially briefed them. And I think they came to planning commission once. but how we do prioritization. So she's gonna refresh that because it's been a few years. There's gonna be a public component to that. And that's actually running a little separate than the comp plan process. It's gonna be almost like a mini version of the bike plan process because we went through the bike plan process. We have one layer of a network pretty much set up. We have a long list of prioritization projects. We went through all that already. Really what we need to do is figure out what we can do in 20 years, which is the financial part and how it fits in with the rest of the other layers of the system. So we're gonna get Rita to help us run through that on a parallel process. And so she will probably be seeing you and touching base with you and the council as well and get hopefully head nods and then we can wrap that into the comp plan process. So we have several things going on concurrently and we hope that will help us. Uh, we are doing things as early as possible that we can, like I talked about the safety part. Safety is, yes, it's dependent on a new network, but it's also dependent on historic places where things have occurred. Um, it's also looking at typical ways you build things and whether there's higher risk or lower risk. So some of those things are not dependent on the plan being further along, so to speak. So some things we can get done a little bit earlier. So we're relying that on as well. I think the last thing is um, community development, you know, really did put together an aggressive timeline to try to get everything done as quick as possible. So there may be a little bit of wiggle room there, but we're not counting on that right now. Okay, that's thanks. how we're trying to do it. Yeah, thanks. I know that's a hard question to answer. Um, I'm just seeing about the bike plan and, and knowing how um, valuable that document is because of how much time was spent on it, but also knowing that there are deadlines for essentially 20 more bike plans <laughs> uh, to, to get wrapped up. And that's um, uh, that's a big deal. So um, I'm encouraged and um, best of luck. And, and speaking to sidewalks, I'd urge you to uh, to state the obvious, keep in mind the users of those sidewalks and go beyond simply the pavement, but the crossings, uh, the signals, you know, everywhere you go is don't walk. Um, should it be walk first? I mean, some, some pretty basic things that go beyond just the pavement there. When we look at how a pedestrian will use those, uh, those routes. So I'd look forward to that. Other commissioner comments or questions? Looking at our Zoom participants, seeing none, and uh, down the table. So uh, I want to thank you for this presentation. It is a huge amount of work and a very compressed timeline, as, as has been said several times, and we appreciate that and wish you the best of luck on it. And we hope to be helpful to you getting through that process. So thank you for coming to us tonight with this and look forward to hearing more. With that, We'll move on to our next agenda item, and that would be unfinished business. Do we have any unfinished business for the group? Looking across. Seeing no indication. Reports from staff. 
I can provide a quick update on middle housing. So we've been working really closely with the city manager's office, with um, project manager Boyd, um, with uh, and with our consultant OTAC to come up with a plan for moving forward with the project, a timeline for adoption, a timeline for more community engagement, and um, are hoping to have all of that pulled together for a presentation to council on March 7th. So that is moving forward. and. Things are happening to get that um, before council and meet some of their desires for additional engagement. Um, beyond that, um, we are continuing to work with Sound Transit on the transfer development rights program, and then um, also should be interviewing uh, historic preservation consultants in the future next week so that we can hopefully fill that role, um, which has been vacant for a while. Thank you. Uh, on the council and middle housing, I'm not sure how many followed the last meeting. Um, my word's not theirs. They are considering slowing things down and seeking more public input. So uh, we'll see. And I think that's some of what will be decided on the 7th. Is that fair? Yeah, we're we're um, working on getting into contract for more work with OTAC. And so we'll talk to them about that contract and then about um, our proposal for additional engagement. Thank you. And I would add, we had about 40 people at the tour this weekend. So people are interested in learning more. And Dave did a great job of showing people around. And Jason and I tried to show people around and missed a few spots. All right, thank you. Uh, moving to our next item, reports from members. Commissioners, any updates for the group? Going once. All right, looks like we're on for a quick meeting tonight. Any items to report to council? I think we made our report on middle housing and nothing new has come since then. All right, with that then, uh, there being no further business, is there a motion to adjourn? Commissioner Kurd. I move to adjourn tonight's meeting. All right, all in favor? We need a second. Oh, is there a second to that motion? <laughs> yes, it's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, tonight's meeting is adjourned at uh, 7.02, perhaps a record quick meeting. Uh, our next meeting will be March 1st. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Thank you all.